I have the privilege of being able to MC this deal. My name is John Welch, and uh, just a little bit about me, uh, I, and then we'll get to the to the real fun part of the of the panel. Uh, my wife Bonnie and I were both born and raised in Midland, Texas, but we moved to Colorado in uh, 1973, and we ranched there. Uh, in southeastern Colorado between Trinidad and La Hanna for 30 years. And then um, in 2003, a good friend of mine uh, named Dub Waldrop uh, came, uh, called us and said that he was going to retire from the Spade Ranches. He'd been the president and CEO of Spades for 35 years. And he wanted me to come down and talk about uh, going to work there. And Bonnie and I had just moved to the ranch. We'd lived on a leased ranch until uh, we could move down there, get all the boys out of school. And we were greatly torn about whether or not to uh, go. And we prayed about it, and we, uh, and, and we talked about it, and we just wanted some kind of a sign. And one day I was out riding a colt in the, in the round pen, and Bonnie came running from the house, and she said, uh, there is a snake crawling across my living room floor. So I ran back, or I told her, I said, run back and keep an eye on where he is, and I'll be there as soon as I can tie this horse up. And I went running over to the house, and she said, he's going up, he was going up the middle post of our dining room table. And I, so I got over there and looked, and it was just a bull snake. So I just kind of eased him out of there and pulled him out and took him and turn him loose at the barn and I came back and she said well we have been wondering about what we should do and she said when God sends serpents into your home we're leaving for Lubbock so that's how we made that decision to go to Lubbock and uh, I was uh, uh, president and CEO of the Spade Ranches for 10 years and my son one of my sons Wesley one of our sons was working for me and I could tell that if, if I didn't uh, give him a promotion, somebody else was going to. And so I retired, and he took over running spades, which he's, he's still doing. And uh, I, uh, Bonnie and I became semi-retired. We've got uh, two sons that live in Colorado, and they're in the cattle business. Andy and his family run our ranches there in southeastern Colorado. And then our son Bob and his family. Uh, Bob's a freelance write, journalist, writer, filmmaker, and then runs about 1,500 head of yearlings on the side. So he's got a pretty busy day. Uh, and Bonnie and I decided what we would do is, is and what we decided to do and what would be a, a, a brilliant plan was we would go stay with Bob and his family until they got tired of us, and then we'd go stay with Andy and his family, and then when he got tired of us, we'd go back to Wesley and stay there until he asked us or told us it was probably time to leave. It's been a very good uh, plan, except it seems to be accelerating. They get tired of us quicker, and we have to move more frequently. So, but otherwise, we're doing okay. Uh, now to get to our real story, I'm I am so proud and pleased to be able to uh, to MC this deal with two of my very good friends here. Uh, Boots O'Neill was born, I believe, in Clarendon uh, just a few years ago, and he has cowboyed all over this country, uh, every big ranch you can think of, uh, J.A.'s, Wagner's, Sixes, bunch more. Uh, and has a lifetime full of experiences that, that, uh, that we'd like for him to share with you. Tom Morehouse has been a, li a lifelong uh, resident of uh, King County, and uh, he and his, his brother Bob runs, uh, ran the pitchforks for years and years. Tom uh, has run Morehouse, uh, the Morehouse Cattle Company all these years, and then he did do uh, about a five, six year stint, wasn't it, with yeah. Tongue River? Yeah. Running Tongue River and then came back to the ranch. His son Gage and 
and his wife Laura are now back to the ranch and Tom's main uh, job is giving advice to Gage that Gage doesn't really think he needs, but Tom still gives it to him. Uh, so, so with that, I'd like to go ahead and, and start. Uh, uh, Boots, maybe, maybe you could get us started and what I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about is when you went at, at, to the JAs for the first time and a little bit about some of your experiences there. All right. I, I, first, I'd like to tell you all, I'd be a lot more comfortable if I, if I was talking to about eight or ten of you in a tent. But uh, we're glad to have the opportunity and what uh, John referred to is uh, I went to work for the JAs when I was 16 years old and uh, I, I want to make references to the difference in the, the time and the way we did things then and now you, you couldn't hire a 16 year old and haul him out in the bottom of the Paladur Canyon and put him out and but uh, the chuck wagon was camped down in the Paladur Canyon and they had a gentleman in a Jeep take me to the edge of the river and, and that's the Prairie Dog Fork of the Red that goes through the, the Paladur Canyon. And that old man unloaded me in my bed and saddle and, and said there'll be some boys come across the river in a wagon in a little bit and get you and he, he left and I, I'm sitting there miles and miles from nowhere out there on the bank of that, right in the bottom of the Paladur Canyon. And I was beginning to wonder if I should have stayed with Mom, but uh, uh, directly I seen a wagon and team pull up on the other side with two cowboys horseback, and they tied a horse. The river was up and running. There's a lot of brush and logs and foam on that thing coming down it, and they tied a horse to the end of the tongue on the lariat rope and put a lariat rope around the wagon box and the running gear and put a horse on the upper side with that to the saddle horn so that water couldn't lift that wagon box out of the, off, off the running gear and uh, jumped in there and come across. It didn't swim them horses, but it was up uh, running in the wagon and. Uh, and come across and got me and loaded my bed and saddle and uh, and took me back across the river and the wagon was camped over on the other side of the river and we reached the wagon and uh, started a, a career that's lasted 72 years there that day. But, uh, Boots, uh, would you tell them a little bit about uh, your wagon driving experience there when you first got there? <laughs> Well, uh, at that time they had a four big perching horses that worked to a chuck wagon and two big perching horses to a hoodlum wagon. And then we had a third wagon, just a regular little ranch wagon, that we had two old bucking horses that we had broke to work and we pulled it with them. And whatever old kid was on the bottom of the pole working with the crew. It was about a 12 to 14 man crew. When we'd move the wagon from one campground to another, why the cook would drive that four horse chuck wagon and, and then the hoodlum would drive that hood wagon and they'd take some old kid and let him drive the bed wagon on the moves. And that was me at that time. And, we were going right down the bed of the Paladur Canyon in the bottom, crossing the water ever that river runs, you know, river, and we'd cross the stream every little bit. And I was sitting up on top of about 15 bed rolls on top of that with them two old horses trying to roll a bull durham cigarette and dropped one of them lines and them old horses left there when that line hit the ground. And as they passed that chuck wagon, well, that old cook hollered, jump off, son, jump off. And I did. And they uh, 
turned that thing over in the river and drug it upside down for a ways and got the beds wet, tore the harness up, and I was reasonably sure that they'd fire me, you know, when we got it straightened out, but uh, that wagon boss happened to be a good fellow that became a close friend, and I worked with him for years after that, but he was uh, real kind about it and told me to be a little careful about smoking, and uh, I might add I don't smoke now. <laughs> so, uh, uh, that, 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 uh, there's nothing like a good first impression, Boots, when you go somewhere. Yeah. Uh, well, Tom, I was going to, uh, any of y'all, there's probably a lot of people out here in this audience, I've seen some of them that have worked for Tom, uh, and you know that Tom will work cattle in open country if he's forced to, but he'd rather be working in the cedars and in the roughest country that he, he can find. And I know uh, I've heard him talk about one time when they were cleaning off uh, what they called the old Ross Ranch. And uh, I'd like for him, if you would, Tom, to tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, I'd be glad to, John. Uh, I've told a lot of cowboy stories and most of them wasn't true. But I'll try to keep these true. I, I was raised by two, my parents were dandy people, good Christian people, and I had three brothers. Bob is here, he's one of the directors. And uh, anyway, my dad raised us up as best as he could and taught us how to cowboy. And, and I never knew anything but what I wanted to do as the cowboy. But we had a ranch leased north of the ranch where I live and called the Ross Ranch. And we'd put 300 Bremer Cross cows there and uh, that came from Pecos and, and they weren't very gentle at all. And, and so we, uh, we had to clean them, uh, move them because we lost the lease. Well, we pulled a chuck wagon across the highway and, and set it up and got a cook and moved the horses over there and seven or eight men and went to gather those cattle. And uh, first we was using a siren because they had come to the siren, but we got a, a good many of them like that, but then the remnants were, weren't gonna come into the siren and so it was quite an ordeal to gather the remnants. And we made a lot of miles and, and some of them were running because the cattle were silly. But anyway, we'd get a little bunch in, and get them to the trap. And sometimes we had to catch them, of course. We didn't want to, it's in the June and it's hot son of a gun. And we couldn't catch them and, uh, and choke them much because we'd kill them. So anyway, we had a problem is we'd catch a cow and maybe a calf would run out off. So we'd be, uh, have a doggie if we didn't get a hold of the calf. So uh, I came up with the idea of getting some little bells, little bells and, and if we caught a cow, we'd put that bell around the cow's neck and turn her loose and she'd get mammied back up with the calf and the brush is real thick, and a lot of canyons. Well, we could, the next day or two, we could hear that bell and know where the cow was, and she might have got with some more, and maybe get her and her calf back to the trap. And so anyway, we, we had a good many of them gathered, and we were gonna head back to the, where we had the wagon set up, to another trap, and uh, so, uh, we left out with those cows and they weren't, they, they were hard to keep holds of and to drive and we had to just really watch them and we left one guy behind to turn the horses out and bring them behind us and I made the mistake of thinking those horses would just follow along behind but when they got there, they were headed for south and they just ran through the cows and scattered them and we, we got most of them back together but Anyway, we lost several, and it's my fault. I did, it just wasn't good judgment. We all sent the horses ahead. And then uh, 
So we got there, and my dad had come out to visit. He was 80-something years old, and he liked to come out and see how we was getting along. So he came out, and it was a real hot day. And Anyway, he came to the wagon. We was fixed to eat dinner, and he says, uh, he, he says, uh, you know, there, there's a boy there, a young boy, and he kept complaining about there wasn't any ice at the wagon. Well, we just, we kept some block ice on the beef, but we didn't have ice in our cups or anything. Didn't need it. And uh, so anyway, he complained about it, and my dad said, Sonny, when we have ice at this wagon, it'll be so cold you won't want to be here. <laughs> and uh, so then uh, he asked me what kind of guy that, ke uh, what kind of hand he was. And I said, well, you have to tell him to either ride up, hold up, or shut up. And he wasn't much help. And so, uh, so we went down after dinner, went to catch his horses, and like I say, it was in the heat of the summer, and we, we'd really been going a long ways, and Daddy says, well, I like to see sore-backed horses and sunburnt men. And I said, well, you ought to be a happy fella then. Well, you know, and I will say this, and a lot of you know this, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> Tom's pretty, pretty partial to those things too. Uh, one little story I'd like to tell because it involves both of these men and it was one of the most enjoyable, eventful trips I've ever taken with anybody is, you remember in 2011 and 12 how terribly dry it was here and how we had to ship so many cattle away. Well, Boots was with the sixes and I was with the spades and Tom was with Tongue River. And we sent cattle from here to almost the Canadian border. Well, the next spring, we needed to uh, brand all those cattle. And we said, well, how are we gonna do that? Well, we put together a, a kind of a modern day chuck wagon situation. Charlie Ferguson, we hired as cook, one of the best cooks you'll ever that's ever cooked at a wagon. And he had a little old half ton pickup and a stock trailer, put everything he needed in that. And there were 12, I think, no, we had six men plus us. And uh, everybody took two horses, so we had 12, or we had about 16 head of horses, two, two rigs. And we started branding south and just moved north. The first place we branded was in uh, Trinchera, Colorado. I wrote, I wrote some of these things down when we were doing this because I knew I'd always want to remember it. We went to Trinchera on May the 20th and we, and we branded uh, 208 calves and then we, next day we shipped 380 yearlings from Rocky Ford up to some pasture and then on the next day, we drove to Harrison, Nebraska. And on the 23rd, we branded 361 calves, and then we moved our camp to Lusk, Wyoming. And at Lusk, Wyoming, we got the idea, save our mesquite, uh, or else we're gonna run out of wood, so we went to burning pine. And we discovered a, a, a physics uh, uh, principle, and that is the embers on mesquite are pretty heavy, and they won't go up the, they don't go up the, uh, flew and out, well on pine they will. And we were eating and looked up and our tent was on fire. We had a good wall tent. We got it put out, but then we went back to Mesquite. Uh, at, there at Lusk, we branded 361 calves. And then we, what we'd done is they'd stripped all the calves off and they used these Nord forks that you put on the, on the calf's neck and, and then you drag him past there and, and so you don't have to hold him down. Uh, but we asked them if we could just leave, the next day we'd like to just leave the cows and calves together and flank them. It, you know, we, we used some of their help and that's the way they want to do it. So that next day uh, we branded 155 calves in 75 minutes. And they said what 
they said a lot of places where we went is you Texans can sure get a lot of work done in a day, but you take all the pretty out of it because they like to use big long ropes and head and heel. And but anyway, we got we got it done. And then the next day we went to Broadus, Montana, and uh, we set up camp there. And it took about it takes about 45 minutes to set our camp up and 45 minutes to Charlie to have the rest of our, our food cook. So an hour and a half and, and we were going. But we branded 196 calves that first day at Broadus. But <laughs> Tom and I, everybody, everybody there was young buckaroos and flat hats and, and long ropes and they would head these calves and then kind of get them up close to the fire and one up and three or four of them would come in and heal the calf they'd take turns till they'd finally catch one and and every cow's running every which way and tom looked at me and he said everything my dad told me never to do we're doing <laughs> and we pretty well were so we had a big meeting that night and we said now tomorrow today we did it y'all's way tomorrow we're going to do it our way and they said okay and by eight o'clock that night there were two uh outfits loaded with horses and buckaroos leaving there so they disagreed with us but the next day we gathered the, those cattle and we had i think 300 and something cattle gathered as we're coming in the gate and the, and the wind had blown the day before 70 miles an hour and as we're coming into the corrals with those cows it started sleeping and by about nine o'clock, when we were ready, to, when we got everything set up and, and our irons hot, it was snowing. And there's 20 miles of that old gumbo clay road to the pavement. And we looked around and it looked like a mutiny was just about to occur. So the guy that owned the ranch, he said, I'm gonna chain up my tractor and I'll go ahead of you and y'all come behind me and if you get stuck, I can, I can back up and pull you out. But we didn't get stuck. We made it all the way to, to the broadest. And it was, by then, it was really snowing. And uh, we went on to Gillette, Wyoming and stopped for fuel. And I looked at the, all those cowboys. They were all getting out of the pickup. And I thought about, you know, in a blizzard, cattle will drift with the snow and you can't turn them around. We couldn't have drove those boys back north again if we'd have held a gun on them. They were ready to go to Texas. And uh, so we did, we went on. But in a, in a 10 day period, we branded uh, 1,355 calves and we drove 2,480 miles. And it was about as much fun as you could have when you were having to work around a drought. So these guys I enjoyed being with and it's, smooth works and we got it all done but that that's not my only story i'll tell I, but i would like to ask boots if he would tell us you know starting colts has changed a lot over the last 60 70 years and i'd like if you would tell us a little bit about you and your brother wes when you used to break horses on the jas if you would <coughs> all right <coughs> I'd like to also, if I take a minute and tell the crowd, so many of y'all wouldn't realize this, that, uh, and there's not very many people out there that could doubt me because they wasn't there. So, uh, uh, that I've cowboyed north of Amarillo about 75 miles between Channing and Adrian and the New Mexico line that's about 70 miles from here, where we stayed out with a wagon two or three months at a time, and where camps that them people lived in didn't, weren't modern, didn't have bathrooms in them. Some of them had coal oil lamps, and they burned coal because there's no wood out there. But, and then I worked at the J. Hayes, and not over 70 miles right out here in that canyon where none of those camps were modern then, and they didn't have bathrooms in them, and they burnt wood, and had coal oil lamps, and uh, it, you just, 
my point is getting to the change now that everywhere is fixed them. They started in the 50s, in the 60s, putting electricity in those camps at the JAs and things that all them things. And now then, all of them have got the uh, modern facilities and bathrooms and uh, and it's a lot a lot easier life and better than back then but getting back to John's question uh, me and my brother broke the Bronx there at the JA's several years in a row and we broke at that time what he's referring to is a difference in then and now we uh, we broke they'd be four-year-olds and they had never had a human hand on them other than when they was four-footed and tied down and cut and branded and they'd run out in the Paladur Canyon and we'd gather them they'd have the three-year-olds in there and the fours and we'd cut the four-year-olds out and turn the three-year-olds back and we tried to have around 50 head every year. And then we'd trail them across there to what we call the Bronx pens there at the JAs. And then me and him would start breaking them horses. And we'd have to four foot a horse in a round crawl, four foot him and tie him down just to put the halter on him. Because there wasn't no chutes or anything like that there. And then we'd let him up and drag him out there and stake him to a stake rock on a big stout horse and uh, we'd stake eight and then in the morning we'd drag them eight back in there and tie them to a krill and we'd ride them, we'd tie a foot up, saddle them and then we'd get on most generally and let the foot down after we got on and uh, uh, and we'd ride them in the round crawl that day and out in the big crawl the next day and go outside the next day and the next and the next. That is five saddles. Two in the crawl, what they'd say, the bosses said, you ride them two in the crawl and three outside. And we'd drive them to the wagon boys. And they'd take them and then we'd start eight more and then eight more and then eight more till we got about 50 of them broke and they would uh, cut your wages off the day you started breaking Bronx. We was getting $90 a month then as cowboys, but, and they'd give us <clears throat> $15 a horse, $3 a saddle, and we'd ride them five saddles and take them. And now, looking back, I don't know how the wagon boys got along with them, uh, now, you know, uh, we ride a lot of these gentle colts more than five saddles and still can't get along with them, but uh, them boys was pretty tough then, and the older men would usually trade with the young fella to ride his a few days, and, and we had to have them broke when we took them over. We'd rope them horseback in a big corral there at the bronc pen get on them and just rope them coming out of a corner and it'll turn them over backwards, drag them around. And uh, they tell me that's wrong now, but then they, that, that's what they wanted us to do. And they wanted to be able to rope him in a rope corral and him stop and turn around and they could lead him out. And, and then we had to, in them five saddles, we'd hobble them every day. And they had to be broke to hobble good. And then the guy out there with the wagon, they could rope him and lead him out of a rope corral and hobble him, and a man could saddle him and get on him, and then he's kind of on his own then. But uh, uh, we uh, broke him, uh, I think it is in about 51, 52, and 53, three or four years in a row, well, that we broke him around 50 head every winter. And, but they, they weren't broke by today's standards when we <laughs> turned them over. You know, I, I can't hardly imagine. I mean, it's one thing to get on one, but to get have one turn to you that was five years old and go do a day's work on it. I mean, I don't know how in the world. But, but uh, talking about horse stories, uh, not horror stories, horse stories, uh, Tom, 
has got a story about cutting stud coats in uh, Borden County. They had a big ranch leased at Borden County. And while we're on the subject of horses, I'd like if you would, Tom, tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we, we raised horses and, and uh, so we had all of our stud coats in Borden County where Mike Stevens lived. And uh, anyway, there's several of them, six or eight or 10. And, so we always cut our own horses, castrate our own horses, and so we decided we'd cut them. We got through work and decided we'd cut them one day. And uh, so we, we ran them, we'd run them in a lot, one in a lot, and, and four-foot him and, and uh, tie him down, and, and, and we branded them when, when, we was, when we cut them. And we, we branded the seed. That was the, still do. Anyway, uh, we was, uh, John was sitting on their head when they were laying down, my brother John, and, and you just get set, straddle his head and pull his head back. And then there's a fellow with, uh, we had a rope on his four feet and he fell a horseback helped the four feet. And, uh, and then I was, uh, Brand, and, I, and John, he was sort of setting up straight, and I said, John, you better rear it back. One of those horses is going to reach up and kick you. Well, John doesn't like for you to tell him anything, and he didn't appreciate it, and, so, and he didn't rear it back. He just stayed where he was. So anyway, I was branding him. I branded this coat, and anyway, the coat got up, and I put that sea about four or five inches too far below where he's supposed to be. And John says, you know, they'll all forget about me sitting on that horse's head wrong by night. He said, as long as that colt's alive, they'll know you branded him wrong. <laughs> and so we named that colt Low C. And we kept him till we re retired him. <laughs> Low C. Um, Boots, tell us about, uh, well, let me back up. One of the most respected, uh, I'd say, cattlemen and, and ranchers off down there in y'all's country was Manfred Elliott. And, and uh, Manfred was a wonderful, wonderful man and a good cow man, and, and he raised uh, some wonderful daughters, one of which uh, Tom was married to, and then he raised some boys, too. Some of them are out there in the audience there. And they were, they, well, he raised some boys. And, uh, but anyway, back when you were cowboying with Manford, uh, I think you had a little experience with him and a couple of horses. Would you relate that to us? Yes. Uh, Manford and I were work during the 50s with, <clears throat> The wagon there at Wagner's, and the wagon stayed out the year around and worked seven days a week. And the, the, uh, I never heard anybody hollering about having to work Sunday. We didn't know when Sunday was. You just worked every day and, and everybody went. But uh, what John's referring to, we was around in a pasture we called Ray and Sandburn. And Manford's horse fell with him, and he was a pretty crazy old horse, called him Ponderosa. And he come by me running, I'm next to him. I'm riding a big black horse called Blackjack that had bucked. And uh, I roped Manford's horse by the saddle horn coming by me wide open, and it, it was a wreck, and I bailed out, and they, Buck run and went down the draw, and Manford and I following them afoot, and we finally caught up with them about a quarter of a mile down there, and they were, they had jerked each other down two or three times a piece, and they were facing each other with that rope tight, just like a calf horse, looking right down that rope, you know, because they had done all that training that people do now to themselves, going down that creek. But, so, uh, <laughs> You had trained rope horses by the time you got to them. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, while we're on the subject of roping, I, I read a deal that Charlie Russell said one time that I think is exactly right. Said the, 
two most dangerous things that a cowboy in, in, is involved in is guns and ropes. He says the guns are dangerous when they go off and the ropes get dangerous when they go on. And, and Tom's got a little story about uh, roping something with a, a bit of a... Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, me and two more guys was going uh, crossing through the country horseback and <clears throat> we, we went into a pasture that we uh, worked and cleaned out, but there's one old cow, horned cow there, and, and she happened to be right close to the gate where we went in. So I jerked my rope down and, and, and the other guy did too. And, uh, but I, I saw it got in the lead and, 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 and she was running full tilt and so was I on a little brown horse. And I roped her just as a big mesquite came up and she went on one side of it and me and that little brown horse started around the other side of it. And like I say, we were running hard. And it just uh, stripped my saddle off of the horse. And my saddle fell to the ground. And the cow was around the tree on the end of the rope, snuffing and pawing. And I was sitting behind the tree, still in my saddle. And, uh, and I thought, well, if I try to get up, that cow sees me, she's going to get me. And uh, so I took, uh, I got a little slack and I took the horn knot off my saddle horn and those other two boys come up and, and uh, they caught the cow. And we loaded her and I got my rope back. But anyway, uh, the good Lord was taking care of me that day. <laughs> uh, sitting here listening to Tom and, and Boots talk, I, I comes to my mind one time, uh, when Boots was, B Boots had gone to the Sixes, how long have you been there uh, at the Sixes? 32 years. 32 years. Well, when, when, when you, Boots's wife passed away, well, he moved to, to the bunkhouse. And when he did, well, Miss Ann, probably one of the most generous, good-hearted women there ever was, she fixed up a, a, a in the, at the bunkhouse, she put two apartments together for Boots and put new carpet. And Tom was telling me all about this. He said, remodeled that bunkhouse for Boots and put in new carpet and paint. And, and even, he said, there's even a, a Watusi in it. And I thought, my gosh, what in the world? He said, oh yeah. He said, it's in, in there in the bathroom, a Watusi. I said, what are you talking about? You know, with the water swirls around, I said, a jacuzzi, that's what. The... <laughs> so, so Boots has got his own Watusi there in his apartment. <laughs> uh, when they fixed that apartment for me there, well, Ann was out there and uh, they had a 18-wheeler pulled up there from Fort Worth and unloading some nice furniture and they carpeted it and some things that's uh, it really nice for a cowboy. And uh, one of the cowboys working there, Mike Jackson, was helping carry a couch in and as he walked by me and Ann standing there, I, uh, I told him, I said, Jackson, I hope you'll see what can happen if you work hard and, and make a good hand for you, yourself. And Ann said, work hard hell, it's cause you got so old, I fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to, Boots, while you're telling uh, Miss Ann's stories, would you tell them about, they used to have a ranch in Montana. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And the trip you went up there with her when she had to do some uh, employee, yeah. <laughs> would you tell that one? Yeah. We, we bought a ranch in western Montana and it had people there and then some of us was going up there and I had stayed there two or three summers after that, but uh, the manager and, and, and the crew boss and the cook, and all of them was telling her how to do things or how they done it. And, uh, 
she didn't like that. She didn't like to hear that we can't do that or that's not feasible or something. She just wanted you to do it, why well, do it? And so one day there, she had a fire and, and fired that general manager and fired that foreman and the cook. The cook come, I remember he come out of the kitchen taking an apron off and just throw it on the floor there as he come out and uh, left some stuff on the stove cooking. And I was outside as she come out to get in her car and uh, she just looked at me and said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, and remember I'm on your side. <laughs> and, and she just laughed and got in her car and drove off. But, uh, uh, well, I tell you, her legacy is considerable and it's probably one of the most generous, uh, kind-hearted people that I, I ever knew. Uh, and she sure took care of the, of the people. Now I'm telling the other and on her and Joe. You go ahead. Uh, Joe Leathers is our foreman and general manager there at the ranch and uh, this happened to him with Ann. Uh, Ann had told him she wanted him to build a, a new dog house. She kept dogs there then to hunt quail and stuff and build a big nice deal. And she said, just take where that one's at and build it right out west. They're a big, nice, so big a deal. And Joe said, uh, well, that'd be all right and we can do that, ma'am, but you, uh, you know, there's a hill right there west of that dog house. And he, he told me this. Said she looked at him and said, is that a problem? <laughs> he can move that. <laughs> that hill can go to <laughs> Well, Tom, I, I don't know. You got any good boot stories you can tell? How much time we got, John? Oh, <laughs> let's see. We got about 10 minutes. Yeah, I got one, Phil. Uh, How, what if I'd have said we had five minutes? Oh, okay. You'd still had one to tell? Yeah, I'll oh, tell yeah, it in a hurry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, we was working up in Hall County, and, and uh, we had a chuck wagon up there, and we was camped up on a hill by a set of pens. And we worked two or three days gathering these cattle, cows, and yearlings. He's in the fall, weaning calves. And uh, so anyway, we ran the cows through and palpated them and, and uh, turned them out. And we, we had trucks coming the next morning to haul those calves back to King County. So anyway, we uh, started raining that evening. And, and that old country, if it rains just a little, it's slippery. So I knew we couldn't get the trucks in. And the, that set of pens didn't have water and we didn't have anything to feed those bawling calves. So I rode across to where there's a telephone and called my dad and, and, and I told him the situation. I says, what do you, I says, what do you think we could do? Reckon we can drive those bawling calves over there to Deer Springs where there's water and hay and, and, uh, and I don't know if, you realize about ball, uh, driving balling cattle, but you just don't drive them. They, just, they don't drive worth the dying. Cause, so anyway, uh, I knew it was gonna be a big chore, but my dad says, you can do it, but it won't be easy. And that's all he said. Well, I was wanting a little instruction, but I didn't get it. So I went back that evening and I made a strategy for the next morning. and. And there's a canyon below where we was camped and it was sort of headed toward the, where we wanted to go with those yearlings. So uh, I decided if we could get them in that canyon and, uh, and go down that canyon, we might be able to hold them up in a little while because we knew we couldn't hold them up when they came out of the pen. So we had men on the side and some of us got down in the canyon where we'd be in the lead and we turned them out and they just stampeded off that hill really running and got to the canyon and so we stayed in front of them for a long ways. Finally got them slowed down and held up and we held them there a good while, maybe 30 or 40 minutes or hour. 
And so uh, by then, we our horse would pretty well give out. So one fellow went back, and we weren't too far from where the horses were, and he went back and got them. We took turns changing horses, and then we pulled out with them and got up on, climbed out of the canyon and hit a road and got the cattle to where we were going, the yearlings. And, and we just lost a few and picked some of them up on the way back. But anyway, that night, I'd give out and roll my bed out and lay down, and, and I thought, well, Daddy said we could do it, but it wouldn't be easy. And sure enough, we did it, but it wasn't very easy. And I got one thing other to add to that. We can live a Christian life, but we can do it, but it won't be easy. <laughs> That's a good, good point. Uh, before we quit, I got to do, I, I want to do two things. Number one is, I need to clarify that the Manford, Manford sons, that was Bob, Bill, and Cotton, they're all good men and good cowboys. Two of them uh, were peace officers, and I just don't want them to all jump me when we leave here. They're good people. Uh, and then the second thing I want to do is, I didn't realize this would happen, but ever since Tom and Boots got here, We'll be out there in the hall, and people want to come up and take the pictures with those two. And for some odd reason, I would say the majority of them are young, attractive girls. <laughs> and and I, want, I wanted Boots to tell you whenever those young, attractive girls get through taking their pictures, what is it you always tell them? I'm available. <laughs> 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 well, we have really enjoyed getting to visit with you, and I know there's some young ladies out there that are anxious to get a picture taken, so I think we'll call it a day, but we sure do. I, I want you to join me in thanking these two fellows for coming and sharing so many good stories with us. Thank you. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <clears throat>